And thank you again for the invitation to talk. Um, as uh, the previous speakers, I've recognised many faces in this room, which is a really nice thing. As a hepatobiliary surgeon, most of the cancers that I treat do very poorly. Uh, so I'm actually, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to treat neuroendocrine tumours because the patients do so much better in comparison. It's also a privilege for me to work here because most of my work comes through Rod and through Michael. And so I see a very different type of patient pool than, uh, patient than uh, other surgeons would in the community. I'm a little dis disappointed with Ben's talk that surgery wasn't one of the five uh, pillars of uh, <laughs> treatment. And, and whilst he was talking, Rod turned around and said to me that he didn't think the scalpel had changed from the 1880s either. So <laughs> I can work through that, though. So my brief is to talk to you about surgery. And Ben's already pointed out to you the enormous um, uh, differences between all these different types of cancers in terms of the type of uh, genomics that they, that they have and, and many other components. Rod's been able to illustrate that with imaging as well. The problem for me then is that I also have multiple different sites of disease uh, to look at. Surgeons tend to decide, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the statement, uh, if in doubt, cut it out. Um, but we, we've tended in the past to just do operations and then if someone was still alive at five years decide, well, that was probably not a bad thing to do, seemed to have worked. And our problem with neuroendocrine tumours is that patients can live for 10, 15 years before they even get symptoms for their disease. So really, where does that leave us? So many would say that surgery is the only potential to cure neuroendocrine disease, but I actually think that that's going to change in the near future and I'm not sure uh, how, what the future holds for surgery in, in terms of the management of these patients. So the first thing to say is that the incidence of these tumours is increasing. Uh, Urban Modelin's published on this. In, in fact, it may not be increasing so much as that we've got better at identifying it. So I have many patients who've been treated as pancreatic cancer or other cancers before, after their six months of treatments and they're still alive. We realise that they never had pancreatic cancer in the first place. It was a neuroendocrine tumour. But to give you some idea as to what that's like in comparison to other cancers that we treat, uh, that's pretty much a similar number of uh, tumours to testicular tumours, Hodgkin's disease, gliomas, multiple myeloma. So actually not as infrequent as we might believe it to be. And this is, uh, there was a, a meeting from the European and African HPBA team and, and multiple other people in London in 2014 when they reviewed many of the protocols that they had for the management of neuroendocrine tumours. And this is, I think, quite a good slide to point out to you the types of neuroendocrine tumours that we see. So the larger pieces of the pie are the proportion of tumours that we see related to the small intestine being the most common appendix, rectum and pancreas, and then to a smaller extent, colon and stomach. The circles within that, though, uh, is the proportion of patients that we see that present with metastatic disease, most usually to, to the liver. So quite common in, in small intestine, pancreas, colon, stomach but actually quite infrequent in patients with uh, appendiceal tumours and with rectal tumours. And that gives, again, that's illustrating the very different biology of these tumours. Rod's already pointed out the pathological differentiation uh, and the importance that ha that has. As a surgeon, we also haven't in the past, but should be factoring in the grade one, grade two, grade three nature of these tumours and how that may affect uh, what we do. A simple rule of thumb, really, is that a grade 3 tumour probably behaves very similar in terms of its survival to the common types of cancers that we see from that, for example, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And again, Rod showed the slide here from Michael Hoffman, which I think really well explains the differences between these types of tumours in terms of the different ways that we treat them and how also uh, imaging with both uh, uh, dotate, uh, I almost called it dotate, just to upset Rod, dotate uh, PET-CT, and uh, an FDG PET-CT have a role to play in helping us to identify the patients that might be suitable for surgery. Uh, a number of years ago now, it feels like yesterday, but it was probably five or six years ago, most of us in the room spent a considerable period of time going through various different protocols and, and publications to produce uh, what were at that stage our Australian guidelines and then our Australian New Zealand guidelines for the management of neuroendocrine tumours. They're a little bit out of date now. There's some new information that should be going into them but they're freely available on the website for people to have a look at uh, and to see the conclusions that we reached at that time. So I'm going to just run through a little bit of a story of the different locations of neuroendocrine tumours and the different ways that we manage that surgically. And I'm going to start, not in the esophagus or at the lips, but I'm going to start in the stomach as, an, uh, as for me, the sort of upper limit of what I treat. And this is, in fact, quite a common type of tumour that we see, just small little uh, neuroendocrine tumours within the stomach. In fact, we probably don't need to worry about them very much at all. The majority of them are related just to uh, an increased production of gastrin within the body, which may be related to medications, but can also be related to tumours. 
And little things like this can just be managed with simple endoscopic techniques of burning those tumours and removing them rather than needing anything much more radical than that. Some of them are associated with a rare syndrome called Zollinger Ellison syndrome. And in fact, these tumours can simply respond to treatment for that tumour and disappear away. Large ones may require uh, a more formal operation, but there are a, a rare group of um, much, small, much larger tumours uh, in isolation which aren't responding to different hormone production within the body that require more formal surgery. And so here's an example here, many different ways to do these things. Most of them are done laparoscopically nowadays rather than open. But for example, a tumour here within the, in the antrum, the lower part of the stomach is simply removed and then a new conduit created for the stomach to drain. Uh, and that would be a common but quite a rare reason now to require surgery for a gastric carcinoid. Gastronoma is on, the, the next few ones I'm going to talk to you about are related to the pancreas and to the first bit of the small bowel called the duodenum. And again, many of these are, are um, described according to the types of hormones that they produce. So gastronoma, uh, they can occur within the wall of the duodenum or within the pancreas. And they can require just a simple excision through an endoscope or a simple operation to remove the lump through to the biggest types of operations that I do, which is removal of part or all of the pancreas to remove those tumours. Sometimes we can enucleate the tumours from the pancreas, which means that we just take the tumour on a little margin of normal tissue around it. Uh, other times we require much larger operations with significant morbidity and mortality. <coughs> With our pancreatic tumours, functioning pancreatic tumours generally, regardless of their size, usually require something to be done about them. And the reason for that is that they can be quite symptomatic. This tiny little tumour here, you can barely see it within the neck of the pancreas, it only measures about eight millimetres in size. But this was in an 80-year-old woman. It was producing insulin and she was collapsing on the ground from hypoglycemia. Uh, and uh, it was quite difficult for her to function from her no normal daily point of view. There are medications to treat that. They weren't uh, useful in her, so she required surgery to remove that tiny little tumour that was causing her so much grief. In the past, we actually found it very hard to find those tumours in many cases, but with the advent of such fantastic functional imaging as GATA PET-CT, we now can find these tumours very easily. In a typical surgical fashion, we used to just take a bet as to which side of the pancreas we thought it might be on and just remove that and see what happened. Uh, which was not a particularly effective way of managing our poor patients. But now we can, uh, much uh, to a greater extent, localise these tumours. And there's even some uh, talk now of being able to use techniques such as an, an endoscope with a small little uh, uh, um, wire on the end of it, radiofrequency ablation, to be able to burn these smaller functioning tumours. And that may be the path that we move to in the future for these small tumours rather than using uh, surgery. Uh, Non-functioning pancreatic tumours are much more common. They probably account for about 50% of all of the tumours that we see. And um, one of the commonest ways that I see these patients is just in someone having an investigation done for no particular reason to look at something else. And we then identify very tiny little tumours here, this one in the tail of the pancreas, and have to work out what to do. The surgery can be quite mor morbid for these uh, small tumours, even if they are done with keyhole surgery. But I think there's a good strong body of evidence now that in fact they don't even need surgery and a period of observation is what's required. With, I have a number of patients now where they've had long periods of observation with very little change in these tumours and we feel that if they're smaller than 20 millimetres or 2 centimetres in size that it's very unlikely that they're actually going to cause a problem. So we tend to move away from surgery in that group. Uh, looking now towards um, small bowel tumours. The problem with the small bowel tumours is that in fact often when they're very small they can cause a lot of problems. And it's not so much the, the small bowel tumour that causes the problem but the lymph nodes that it spreads to in the surrounding area. So this is a diagram of all of the small bowel. This is part of the pancreas that's been removed but this is the first bit of the small bowel, the duodenum. All the small bowel through to the right side of the colon. And tumours tend to occur, neuroendocrine tumours tend to occur in the small bowel, more usually around the ileum and in the terminal ileum. And you can see this complex array of blood vessels, which we call an arcade of blood vessels, that are bringing the blood to the bowel and then the veins that are draining away. And it's the lymph nodes that occur in this area here that really cause the terrible symptoms that patients may get of abdominal pain and uh, difficulty eating and, and bowel obstruction rather than the much smaller tumour that we often see within the wall of the bowel itself. <coughs> 
when we find these early enough, uh, in the absence of metastatic disease, after all of the investigations that we do, we can just remove them, usually by removing that portion of the bowel and the lymph nodes that are involved and joining them back together, much like a plumber would fix a pipe, nothing very special. Appendiceal tumours, this is the appendix here hanging off the cecum. It's probably one of the commonest types of things that we see, and we still argue a lot about what may be the best way to manage them, but in fact the majority are just managed by simply removing the appendix. With others where we're a bit more concerned, having further investigations to look for lymph node disease, and they may require removal of the right side of the colon, which is illustrated here, with removal of a small bit of the small bowel, the blood supply, and then joining everything back together again. Uh, moving towards uh, the lower end now, the colon, again, treated in a very similar manner. Removal of that portion of the colon, much the same way that colon cancer would be treated. But small tumours within the rectum can just be managed as they can be managed within the stomach through an endoscope. This is the small tumour here sitting within the rectum. A wire has been placed around the bottom of it and tightened and then electrical current run through it to simply remove that tumour. So a much less morbid and complicated procedure than may have been required if the rectum was required to be removed. Uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about what I predominantly deal in. I don't get to see the nice, simple neuroendocrine tumours. I wish I did. Um, but I get to see the people who've got quite advanced disease who, in the majority of cases, actually probably aren't fit for surgery. The commonest place for uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumour of the gut to spread to is to the liver, and there's several examples here of the types of tumours that we see. We may see just a single tumour within the liver, which is quite straightforward to remove, and we would expect that patient to do well. We may see some patients who've got disease predominantly on one side with one spot on the other, what we would call type 2 or type B. And then we have these patients here where really the whole liver has been replaced by cancer, which is spread from the, from the primary tumour, where in fact that liver is still functioning, but there's no way on earth that we could construct an operation to be able to uh, remove those tumours and let it regrow again. Here's an example, uh, a recent example, a young woman only in her 30s with a, uh, a um, grade 2 pancreatic neuroendocrine tumour with liver metastases just here. And she had surgery to have both of those, to have three liver metastases and the main tumour removed. And so we would hope uh, by doing that that we've cleared her of her disease. But we still remain unclear about whether or not that is uh, the case. If it does spread to the liver, it's a worse prognostic fact. It's the worst prognostic factor of all of the prognostic factors that we look at for neuroendocrine tumours. Uh, with a, a difference in survival in those patients who have liver metastases compared to those that do not. Um, we know that for somewhere, I mean, this is, gives you some idea about the evidence that we're using here. When one study says 40% of patients have got tumours that have spread to the liver and the other one says 95% of patients, it's probably not a bad time for me to tell you a little bit about surgical evidence when it comes to uh, management of this disease. So there is very little surgical evidence to support any of the things that we do for neuroendocrine tumours at the moment. And part of the difficulty for that is already the, that you've learnt that they're all very different and it's very difficult to group tumours. They are relatively rare, so no one institute has a big group of patients that they can rely on to produce information about how to manage it, and that's why being involved in a collaborative like Ben's where all of that information is put together is a much more effective way of trying to work out the right path. But also that a lot of surgeries have been tried with very little evidence with a disease that's often very slow growing and so it's very hard to know about the impact of those cancers on patients. So Rod doesn't like these diagrams for one reason, I don't like them for other reasons because I'm not exactly sure still exactly what they represent and what they mean. But essentially if it has spread to the liver, we know that that's a problem. So what is the evidence for removing it? So as I've said before, almost all of the studies that we see in the literature are retrospective, which means we've gone back and looked at them uh, rather than the collecting the information at the time. And so that may therefore mean that we miss things and the evidence isn't as good. Very few centres, you know, most of the studies that we have uh, are over 20, 25 years and they've collected 80 patients, which is when you sit down and work it out, three or four patients a year, which is not a great amount of information. There's been very little information in the past when we've done these studies using techniques such as rods, using functional imaging to group these ca uh, cancers, almost nothing in terms of the types of mutations that they have. And, uh, and these are some of the enormous difficulties for surgeons in terms of trying to work out what to do for our patients. Again, from the African and European uh, hepatopancreatic biliary meeting in, in uh, London in 2014, they put 
all of the information that they could find together to try to get some feeling as to the best way to manage patients with liver metastases. And what you can see here is just the different survival according to the different treatments. But you've got to remember here that we've selected patients to have a particular treatment because they're better than other patients. So some of the differences that we see here is just that the surgeons have taken all the best ones, we've done our operations. The, one, the people that aren't so good, we send them to the oncologists, they take their cut, what's left over goes to Rod. Uh, and then after that, the patients who can't have any of those treatments don't do so well. So some of the things that we see here when we look at these studies uh, because we've selected patients along the way. But you can see really still that in this study here that the best survival seems to be in those patients that we have chosen to have liver surgery for the disease. But I think you need to take all of that with a bit of a grain of salt. This slide's a bit historical, but when we do an operation, the first thing that we would say is first do no harm. So are we harming people by doing this surgery in these, thing, in these patients? And so these are all about 15 to 20 years old now, but the things that we look at are the perioperative mortality, so we don't want patients dying from a condition that they may have survived from from a considerable period of time. And the majority of the time now we can offer quite safe surgery in the highly selected patients. And you can see that at five years' time many of these patients are still alive. That tells you that they're alive, it doesn't tell you whether or not they actually have their disease back again. So I think the future really holds combinations of treatments for these patients. This is a young 17-year-old boy who I took this enormous tumour out of his liver back in 2004, and it was only then on the pathology that we found out that he had a uh, neuroendocrine tumour. He then had scans done by Rod that showed that he had other small spots of disease within his liver. He's had seven cycles of treatment over the years with peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. He's now married with children working 12 years later, uh, and he's done extremely well. I'm not sure that all of that was related to my surgery. I'd like to tell you that it was. But I'm sure, in fact, a, a much greater component of why he's been doing so well is related to his receptor, peptide receptor treatment. In those patients in the liver where we can't, or even elsewhere where we can't remove their tumour due to multiple different reasons, what other things can we try? Rod's previously published, uh, and Michael and I, on a, a group of patients who've had peptide receptor therapy, which has shrunk the tumour and then allowed other procedures to be performed. And it may be in those patients that we move towards peptide treatment in the future and then may, in some of those circumstances, go to surgery later on. Again, another historical thing for patients is that there was a paper published 20 or 30 years ago now saying, well, if we chop out 90% of the tumours, maybe that'll make the patients a bit better. So we'll select the best patients again, we'll try it out and we'll see what their symptoms are like. That's still frequently uh, quoted now. It's not something that I abide by. In fact, we get pretty good symptom control now just with the new medications that we have and with the other treatments that we have. So uh, I don't believe that that's an effective therapy at the moment in all circumstances. What about liver transplantation? You know, what if, what if the liver's involved and there's no tumour anywhere else? Why don't we just take the old liver out, put a new liver in? Will that fix the problem? Uh, it's certainly been tried. The way that we normally gauge success for liver transplantation is that we want about 80% of our patients to be alive at five years. Well, in some circumstances, we could do that without even giving them a liver transplant. The problem with these patients is that here you can see they've got really excellent five-year survival, but in fact, there's almost no patients who are alive at five years who don't have recurrent neuroendocrine disease within their body. So in Australia, with such limited organs available, it's not a, it's not a resource that we've decided to use for that. I'll just skip past that. There's a number of other scenarios that are often talked about where uh, the tumour can't be removed. Is there something else that we can do? Um, really, this needs to be discussed amongst multiple different people to make decisions about it. The commonest one is those patients who are getting terrible symptoms from their small bowel neuroendocrine tumour and lymph nodes, but they've got, lymph node, they've got liver metastases and other disease that isn't resectable. Is there a role for removing that small bowel tumour and the lymph nodes? Will that make them better off? Most of the evidence at the moment is pretty weak. Some people believe it helps, others don't. I still don't think we've answered that question at the moment, but it's certainly something that we consider in patients when they're having significant symptoms that we can't resolve. Uh, the other then is uh, whether or not um, resecting parts of the pancreas, would that be of use in the setting of metastatic disease? And again, there's been a number of papers that have talked about less complications and less problems, but I'm still not clear in my own mind whether or not that's actually going to be of value in the future. And again, at the moment, there's very little evidence to support that. Lastly, I just want to draw your attention 
On the website, there's an important, uh, on the COSA website, there's an important thing about preoperative and intraoperative management for patients with neuroendocrine tumours because sticking a needle into some of these things can make you pretty sick. So um, there's quite a lot of information there about preoperative preparation for patients, which is something that our anaesthetic department here at Peter Mac has led the way in terms of getting patients prepared for their surgery so they have the least consequences pos possible. And although not mentioned today, another important component for many of the patients that we see is the disease that they get of their heart, so-called carcinoid heart disease related to the valves within their heart. Again, a difficult thing to manage, but we have a program here of patients receiving cardiac assessment and even tricuspid valve replacement prior to treatment uh, for the rest of their tumours. So thank you very much.